as Plato has Socrates sketch out this, this ideal city, this ideal human community that responds to the kinds of needs and wants and desires that, that are part of the human condition, we find that Plato proposes a class system. And it's not a class system in the sense that we're used to thinking about because we tend to think in terms of income or social classes. There's a little bit of that here, except that, interestingly enough, the people who are at the top don't make any money. They uh, are deprived. They're not allowed to enjoy the fruits of, uh, of rule or, or dominance. At the top we have the guardians, and he clarifies and says, look, we really need to say that, that these are the true guardians. These are the ones who really deserve the name, the rulers, the ones who take care of the city by arranging everything, by producing good laws, by doing the planning, by all the sorts of things that go into making a city run. And then there are the auxiliary guardians, the, the ones who he called guardians at the start in book two, and he's going to change that a little bit later. These are the soldiers, the police. We could think of other professions where courage and resisting danger for the benefit of the community is required, like, say, firefighters. Um, you could probably come up with a lot of other things. And then there's the class of just everybody else. And... Plato is willing to lump in there even people like the priests or the, the skilled craftsmen. They just have their jobs that they do, and so long as they stick to their jobs, everything's fine. As a matter of fact, they can even own property, they can become rich, they can chill out and, and hang, you know, get, get their work done. These guys are the ones who actually have the, the, the jobs that are like salary jobs where you're never really off the clock. So the question is, then, how do we make sure that these people, that these social roles, that these classes, are actually doing what they need to do so that the city can run well? And we can, we can do a couple different things. We can look for, say, aptitude, right? And that's what I have down here. <clears throat> Plato says, you know, we do need to look for people who are, are spirited, who have that sense of, you know, I'm going to get engaged, but are also gentle. They're, they're not, you know, just totally out of control. We don't want any berserkers as the soldiers in, in this city. Um, and then, you know, when it comes to the rulers, we want people who are actually curious, who are intelligent. And so, you know, he talks about this a little bit. The question we want to ask ourselves is, is it going to be enough to find the right talent, or do we have to develop that talent further? But let's look first at his discussion. So this is the end of uh, our, our reading of book two. He says, we need these people to be full of spirit, full of thumos, full of, of, of as they say, spit and vinegar. I know they, there's another word that they use for that, but I, I'm going to keep it clean here. So he says, how are we going to find a gentle nature who also has a great spirit? It seems like they're contradictions. People who are laid back, gentle spirit, they don't tend to be the go-getters. They don't tend to be the ambitious ones, the ones who are getting involved and, and making a difference. These seem to be at antipodes with each other. And so he says, well, let's think again about dogs. Many animals furnish examples of these, these natures that are gifted with opposite qualities. Our friend the dog is a good one. You know that well-bred dogs are perfectly gentle to their familiars, and acquaintances, and the reverse to strangers. So remember, we wanted the auxiliaries to be the kind of people who would fight in war against the, the enemy, or if they're police, they're going to resist the criminal within. But we want them to be good, we want them to be kind, we want them to be gentle with the civilians, the citizens of the city. So he says, um, there's nothing impossible or out of the order of nature in finding a guardian who has a similar combination of qualities. Would, would not he who's fitted to be a guardian besides the spirit of nature need to have the qualities of a philosopher, he says. And here he's going to actually start talking more about the higher guardians. So he says, and he's joking around here, he says, the trait that I'm looking for is actually found in a dog. Um, why? Because the dog is going by making everything depend on knowledge. When a dog, when he sees a stranger is angry, 
uh, but when he sees an acquaintance, he welcomes him. Why is this? Well, because it depends on knowledge. He knows the, the, the person that he likes. He doesn't know the stranger. And so he says, surely this instinct of the dog is very charming. Your dog is a true philosopher. Now, Plato doesn't believe that for a minute. Dogs are not philosophers, but he's, he's making a metaphor here. And he says, he uses this criterion of knowing and not knowing. And then he goes and he makes an inference. And must not an animal be a lover of learning? That's what it means to be curious. That's also part of what goes into intelligence, to be a lover of learning. That's what, for Plato, fits a person to have authority, to have power, to have uh, a position, to be put in charge. Because if you put other people in charge who just want power for its own sake or just want it for the money, eh, things don't go so good. But if you put somebody in power who actually wants to figure out what the good thing is, you're a lot better off, you're a lot more likely for them to make good decisions. So he's talking about this person here. Philosopher is somebody who loves learning, who loves wisdom. That's what philosophy is. So he says, may we not say confidently, confidently a man also, that he who is likely to be gentle to his friends and acquaintances must by nature be a lover of wisdom and knowledge. So he's saying there's some sort of connection between these two. Now, at the end of that, he's saying, that's great. We we've, we've found our, our candidates. How are we going to educate them? But why does he have to think about education? Isn't it enough just to go with this you know, aptitude or disposition? These people are suited to rule. These people are suited to do the fighting. No, it takes training. Human beings, unlike most other animals, aren't just a matter of instinct. If these are, to some degree, instinctual or dispositional, something that they're, they're born with, that's not enough. Those things have to be developed further. And that's what he's going to talk about in Book 3 and in many of the other books in this uh, dialogue. So, I may actually erase more, uh, but let's stick with this for the time being. What do we need to, to say about these, these people? He, he talks about lying, right? Um, Plato is, is very interested in truth and lying, and what the guardians or the rulers are going to, to say about that. Why is he so concerned with that? Because he thinks that the, the culture, the predominant culture of ancient Greece, contains um, some truth and far too many lies. And if you're trying to educate somebody, you need to actually teach them the truth of things. If you want somebody to understand human nature, their own nature, what's good for them, you can't bring them up on a bunch of lies. So he says the rulers are going to have to punish anybody who is telling lies. He says the rulers can lie for the common good, only for the common good. And we'll talk about the idea of the noble lie in a bit. But nobody else should meddle with anything of this kind. For a private man to lie to them in return is to be deemed a more heinous fault than for the patient or the pupil of a gymnasium not to speak the truth about his own bodily illnesses to the physician or the trainer, or for a sailor not to tell his captain what's happening about the ship. If the ruler catches anybody beside him lying in the state, then he'll punish them. Why? Because it's destructive of the society. Then he goes on to talk about some other dispositions. What else do we need? So we need people to be truthful. We need people also, he says, to be temperate. What does it mean to be temperate? You might think that that means that, you know, it's, it's warm outside and not too cold, not too hot. Temperance means moderation and self-control. So you don't want the warriors to be a bunch of drunks or a bunch of druggies, you know, constantly getting in trouble because they're, they're not going to be very good at their jobs, let alone if the rulers are, are in that case. So he says, 
um, temperance, what does that consist in? He says, are not the chief elements of that obedience to commanders, being able to control oneself, and self-control and sensual pleasures. So we're going to prove language like that of Diomed and Homer, friends sit still and obey my word, and the Greeks marched breathing prowess, um, you know, and all sorts of things. But what about these sorts of things? Oh, heavy with wine, who, cat, who has the eyes of a dog and the heart of a stag. Are we going to allow that sort of thing to be said and to be approved of to our young guardians? No. Why? Because that's going to be sort of teaching them intemperance. And Plato is very attentive to the effects that artistic representations, you know, for us, that would not just be the poets, that would be Netflix and Hulu and all these, these you know, shows that we watch, and YouTube, and our music, and we could keep on adding in all these cultural products, our blogging, right? These create the fabric not only of a society, and they're not just, they're not just purveying information, they're purveying attitudes. They are inculcating attitudes about what's right and what's wrong, what's, what's to be approved and what's to be criticized. So if we want people to be temperate, we need to actually put examples before them, and we need to, to laud temperance. So he says, um, we, you know, we, we want to get over some of these. He's got some, some good examples. The saddest of fates is to die and meet destiny from, from hunger. He says, that's not, a, that's not the sort of thing we want our, our guardians listening to. Um, what about money? Do we want them to be greedy? Uh, we must not sing to them of gifts persuading gods and persuading reverend kings. We want them to be um, imitators of something else. Now, he brings up this term imitation, and that's part of what's going on in art and go going on in culture, this imitation process. That's how we become truthful. That's how we become temperate. It says, let me ask you whether our guardians ought to be imitators. Um... And he says, can, can our guardians imitate other functions? Can they imitate other people? Can they live their ways of life, even if just partly? Can they be like kids who put on a costume or play act or engage in, you know, cops and robbers for a while? He says, no, they can't really do that. If they want to be good at their job, if they want to fulfill their role, they need to stick to that. So he says, no man can imitate many things as well as he would imitate a single one. So if there's going to be anything they should imitate, the, the auxiliaries ought to imitate the heroism of other auxiliaries. The guardians ought to imitate the wisdom of other guardians. So he gives examples about tragedy and comedy. He says, um, the same people can't do the same, the same things. So if we adhere to our original notion and bear in mind that our guardians are to dedicate themselves totally to the maintenance of freedom in the state, making this their craft, and engaging in no work which is not bare on their end, they ought not to practice or imitate anything else. If they imitate at all, they should imitate from youth upward only those characters which are suitable to their profession. The temperate. And then he also brings up the courageous. The holy, the free, and the like. But they should not imitate those who are base, those who are, are coarse, those who are cowardly, because then they're going to start to take on that kind of character. So he says, um, how are we going to be able to figure this out, though? What, what are these things? Here, Plato is going to bring up a very important point that leads to what we call the, it's not called here in this, this text, but it's going to be called this in um, other places, the doctrine of the forms. And the basic idea behind the doctrine of the forms is that um, there we go. The things that we see, the visible things, the things that we encounter in our, our experiential uh, life are many, they're multiple. 
So if we're thinking, for example, about courageous people, let's just take that. So we have a courageous man, right? And we have a courageous woman. And now we have another courageous woman. And we can keep on going on and on and on. How do we recognize all these as courageous? Is courage just a name that we apply to them? Then it starts to seem like it's totally arbitrary. There must be some quality they actually have in common. For Plato, that quality is the courage that they possess, and none of their courage is perfect. All of their courages refer to the ideal form of courage, which would be totally courageous. And we're able to recognize these as courageous people, as having courage. We're able to, to make sense out of what they have because there is this pattern, as he calls it, this form, this idea in, in Greek, idea, that we're able to use, that we have some dim recollection of that we can recognize. So he says, Let's think about how this works. Just as in learning to read, we were satisfied when we knew the letters of the alphabet in all their sizes and combinations. Um, we were able to make them out um, as we recognize the reflection of the, the letters in the water or in a mirror or when we, only when we know the letters themselves. The same art and study giving us the knowledge of both. There's a key idea. There's some sort of knowledge that helps us make this identification. We want our guardians, he says, neither we nor our guardians whom we educate can ever become, as he says, musical, that is versed in, in uh, you know, education, until we and they know the essential forms in all their combinations and can recognize them in the images. See, for, for Plato, not only are painted images or you know, literary images or an actor up on stage, not only, not only are they imitations of some, some truer reality, even the courage that we feel, that we possess, that we act on, that we exemplify, is just an image, an imitation of the true reality of courage in itself. And we want to be able to understand what that is. Without a, a reference to that, we're in a certain way blind. We're not able to make sense of it. And so we're going to make mistakes when it comes to, say, courage. So he says, um, this is what education should provide us with. It's going to harmonize us with these, these ideal realities, he says. Now, what can take that knowledge away from us? What can get in the way? Pleasure and pain, intemperance, wantonness, certain kinds of love can, can pull us away from that. So we want to be careful with the sort of affects or emotions or desires uh, or feelings that, that come up. So he goes on and he says, um, we need to train these people both in body and mind. That's why he talks about music and gymnastic. We tend to think of gymnastics as a very specialized kind of exercise. He means bodily exercise in general. And music, he means mental exercise and training, education in general. So he says, um, we need these guardians to develop this ability to see the ideal in the material. They also have to undergo training, rigorous training um, of the body. They have to avoid intoxication, he says. Um, they have to learn how to eat, you know, food that's fairly simple. Um, now, why? He says, neither of these two arts, music and gymnastic, is really designed one for the training of the soul, the other for the training of the body. They're really both to train the soul, 
to train the mind, to train the personality. He says, as a matter of fact, if you devote yourself just to the body, you're actually not going to come out very well. It produces a temper of hardness and ferocity, he says. We don't want that. We want our guardians to, to be in a kind of harmony. And so, remember, we began with sort of their raw talent, their raw um, aptitudes. And now we're seeing these aptitudes develop in the crucible of an education, which is partly an education towards things, saying, look, these are the examples you should be imitating. Here's the knowledge that you should be acquiring. Here's the discipline that you have to undergo. It's also an education away from other things. Don't pay attention to, you know, that music over there, to those TV shows. Don't pay attention to the heroes that aren't really heroes. Plato wouldn't have, him, wouldn't have people watching Breaking Bad, for example, right? He'd have them watching other things instead. So he goes on and he says, um, here we go, um, music and gymnastics, or body and mind, need to be harmonized. Let's put this up here. There we go. These are all ultimately for the soul. And there has to be a proper proportion between these two. So he says, um, here we go. What, why do we want to avoid getting into disproportion? He says, our guardians need to have certain qualities. This by itself will promote a kind of hardness, ferocity. It'll promote the spirited side of things. It'll promote what we call thumos and what we're going to talk about a little bit more. If all we do is focus on this, then the, as he says, the mere athlete becomes too much of a savage. On the other hand, the person who's only playing, paying attention to music, or we'll call it culture, um, there's a tendency to become sort of weak, to become lax, to become too uh, gentle, to, to not really have the kind of rigor that's needed. So what we want is something in between. We want this balance. So they, they have to be in harmony. The t harmonious soul is both temperate and courageous. We want that in our guardians. There's a last point that we have to talk about here with respect to the education of these, these two important classes. And Plato is going to talk about the need to observe them throughout their life as children in order to test them, to make sure that the, the guardians who we saw have a sort of aptitude and are receiving an education, education, um, and a sort of discipline. We need to see whether all of this leads to the right choices. And so how do you tell that? Well, the only way to actually do that is to put people to the test. So he says, um, let us note among the guardians who in their whole life show the greatest eagerness to do what is good for their country, the greatest repugnance to do what is against their interests. These are the people we want. Let's watch them to see whether they preserve, preserve their resolution and never under the influence of either force or enchantment forget or cast off their sense of duty to the state. How cast off, Glaucon says. I'll explain it to you. Here's the way a resolution can go out of a person's mind. It can go out of their mind willingly or unwillingly. Willingly, when we see that it's better to do this, and, and we resolve to do, do this, we say, yeah, but that's good over there. Unwillingly, when it's um, leading us to something evil, to something that's false. So he says, 
Do you not see that men are unwillingly deprived of good and willingly of evil? It is not to have lost the truth and evil, and to possess the truth of good. And you would agree that to conceive things as they are is to possess the truth. So how do we actually, what is he talking about there? How do we actually fall into error? How do we make mistakes? How do we make the wrong choices instead of the right choices? He says, well, this deprivation of the truth is either caused by theft or force or enchantment. And so Socrates says, I understand this is a little hard to get. I mean that some men are changed by persuasion. Some forget. Argument steals away the hearts of one class and time the other. And this I call theft. Something is stealing away the truth. Making the right choices is dependent on preserving the truth. Those, again, who are forced are those who the violence of some pain or grief compels to change their opinion. I tell you, unless you recant, I'm going to punish you, and you find some way to change your mind. And then he says, you would also acknowledge that the enchanted are those who change their minds under the softer influence of pleasure or the sterner influence of fear. So who do we want? We want the people who are not going to be affected by pain, pleasure, desire, fear, other people's pressure, culture. We want people who are going to stick with the truth and cleave to that good so that they can make the right choices throughout the course of their life. And we have to observe them to see who is actually able to do this. Because we can't predict, just on the basis of aptitude, education, and discipline, that everybody is going to, in fact, succeed. 